Hey everybody, uh, my name is Alex Nanevsky, just flew in from Madrid. Um, and I will be uh, telling you things about separation logic and concurrency. Okay, so the four lectures, I was thinking how to design them, and so I decided to do it this way. So the first lecture would be separation logic basics for sequential programming, and then how to scale that to coarse grained. Uh, concurrency, and then fine-grained concurrency, and then examples, okay? So the idea is basically to give you a hands-on experience. So it will be mostly based on examples, rather than, you know, a lot of semantics and whatnot. What I want to give you is basically the feel how the, how the logic works, okay? Uh, so then, if, should you choose to perhaps pursue this topic further, you, could, you, know, you will be able to read the literature and figure out stuff on your own. You will have the intuition behind it. Um, that said, I will do it a little bit in my way, so not exactly uh, uh, in the standard way, but when I do stuff like that, I will tell you uh, what's not standard then, so, so you can compare. So let me start with the basic motivation, okay? <clears throat> so we are in a setting of imperative programs, okay, and we are trying to, with pointers, and we are trying to reason about them using horror style logic, okay? So I'll give you an example which is in fact classical, it's, it's the example that John Reynolds used in his first paper on, on separation logic. So we're trying to reverse a list in place, linked list in place, single linked in list in place. So here's the program. We have two variables, done and i. So okay, done will be the pointer to what we have already reversed, so initially it's null because we didn't reverse anything, and i is the head of what's left to reverse. I'm mixing notation here, so I'll, I'll fix it eventually. So let's see. <coughs> okay. So the situation is obviously, okay, let me go really basic. We have our list here. Okay, this is done is initially now, and what you're trying to do is switch, swap these pointers to, well, this should go to now, and then this should point to this guy, this should point to this guy, this should point to this guy, and then I should end up here. Now, I wrote it in, in some pidgin language here, but let me change the notation a little bit, just to make it clear. to make a distinction between pointers and variables. Um, so I want done to be a variable, so I want to be assigning to it using functional programming notation, so I'll write it like this. Uh, k is a variable, so I want to be ri writing to it like this. These guys as well. But i plus one is a pointer, so I want to write to use this notation for it, the, the colon equals. Um, this is a little bit non-standard, so in separation logic people, they would write, you know, i points to v would be written as this, i points to bang v, so read would be written as that, and what I write here as uh, x points to v, they would write as this. Just so you know in case you decide to read some separation logic papers. Anyway, we'll stick with this. So what are we trying to show here? Obviously, we're trying to show that if we start with a certain list in the beginning, in the end, we're going to get that same list, but reversed. So we need to write some logical predicates to say what a list is. <coughs> so we need some predicate as a first step. Let me call it is list, which takes a head pointer. Let me call it P for pointer and then a purely functional list alpha. And the meaning of this is supposed to be that if you take the pointer p and follow the links from it, let's say p is something like that, then alpha is what's stored in all this, in, in the nodes of the, 
in the body of the nodes. Okay. So you see the distinction here. We have a linked list here, and then for specification, we have purely functional linked uh, list. So this is the list that you build using nil and cons, and you can reverse and concatenate and so on. So your stuff from Haskell, if, if people are familiar with it. By the way, how many people have heard of separation logic before? Just a, oh, everybody. <laughs> okay. How many people are really familiar with it? Okay, let's. So this is not a waste of time that I'm explaining this in this much detail. Okay. Okay, so if we have a predicate like this, we want to write, let's call this program reverse. We want to, we want to write <coughs> a whole logic specification, a whole logic triple. We write a precondition and a postcondition. And in the precondition, we'll say something like, okay, from a predicate, um, well, in this case, we have, let's see, i, we have some list alpha zero. And then we do the reverse. And then, in the end, we have in the pointer done, we have, um, well, rev of alpha zero. It's clear what rev is, right? No? OK, let me, <laughs> let me write it. Yeah, but on purely functional. All right. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so any ideas for people who are not familiar with separation logic? How to write this predicate? Any candidates for an answer? No? Nobody ventures? Okay, let me give you a wrong approach first, because that, that will motivate separation logic. So I don't want the people who actually know the trick to, to give the right answer right away. Um, and this is the first attempt that, you know, John Reynolds himself said, this is what I tried and, you know, here's why it didn't work. Um, <coughs> when we have a null pointer, um, <coughs> I'm sorry. When you have a pointer P and a list which is empty, what do we want to hold of our, of our space, of our, of, our, of our layout in the space of, of our linked list? Well, one option would be to say, well, P must be a null pointer. Okay? If we have a cons, always define your predicates by, inductive, by induction on something. So here it will be the induction on the structure of the, of the contents of, of our linked list. So if we have a cons here, What can we say? <coughs> well, we will want that the pointer P is a head, right? So it points, and let me write it like this for now. P points to a field, uh, I'm sorry, an, uh, a node with two elements, with two subfields. Let me call them X and Q, and I'll write them like this. And then out of Q, we have a list whose content is XS. And then Q is existentially quantified. Okay. So that's certainly one possibility which would describe how your heap looks like at the beginning and in the end. <coughs> now, one problem is that we actually, when we are verifying a program like this, which has a loop, we have to describe how the heap looks like in the middle as well. If you've heard of our logic, you would have heard the word loop invariant. Okay, you need to say how, what's happening in the middle. And here, the picture, uh, of course, what we have in the beginning is Dan and I here. What we have in the end is Dan and I here. What we have in the middle is, is Dan and I in the middle. Okay, so let me just draw the picture. <coughs> so Dan is this pointer and I is this. Okay. <coughs> um, and it turns out, if you describe, okay, and, and if you say that your loop invariant is then the description of this picture, that would be done as follows. We can say exists alpha and beta, purely functional lists, such that we have a list from done, which we will call beta, and we will have a list from i, which we will call alpha, and 
uh, okay, our initial alpha zero is reversed of beta concatenated with alpha. Did I get that right? Reverse of alpha concatenated with beta, I'm sorry. So this is a good candidate for a loop invariant, intuitive at least, but it turns out that it's actually not. And the way in which this fails to be a loop invariant is instructive. Okay? And here's the situation. This definition, let me erase, or maybe I should just draw a different picture. <coughs> this definition of this list allows you to write or to describe uh, pictures in space which have overlapping nodes. Okay? So here's one. Okay, uh, let's write one more. Say we have done here, and I is this one. And then we have reversed this. But this guy points to the end node here as well. So there is sharing. The list out of done and the list out of I share the last node. Now, you can see why that predicate that I claimed is the first candidate for a loop invariant would hold of this situation. Certainly we have a list in this heap out of done, beta, that would be this guy, and we have another one, just a two element thing, which would be alpha. So that thing holds. But if you actually try to run the loop, or run the body of the loop twice on this thing, you will get a situation which is not describable by, by this predicate. So that thing is not a loop invariant. Let's try just to run it. Okay, so what, what do we do? Uh, <coughs> we're trying to, okay, swing this guy to, to delta. Okay, we are reversing him. Then we are swinging i to go to the next guy here. And delta goes here. And then if you try to run the loop again, um, <coughs> okay, this is empty. I becomes empty, so we are done. Okay. But we swing this guy to done. So that means we create this thing here, and then done, done moves as well over there. But now you see what we're having. We have a cycle in the list, done, okay, which means that the situation cannot be described by that predicate, okay, because that predicate just describes finite things because, you know, you give a purely functional thing, the size of that has to run through the, through the whole space. And here we have a loop. So that thing allowed a situation in which if you run the loop body twice, we get somewhere where, where that doesn't hold, so this is not a loop invariant. And the problem is, obviously, the fact that the loops out of done and out of i overlapped in one node. Okay, so we need to strengthen the situation. The, the thing is, in this program, the situation where you actually have an overlapping never appears because done starts empty, i starts like a list, and all you do is keep shuffling nodes. So if the things were disjoint in the beginning, they, they will always be disjoint. But you need to capture that in the loop invariant. Okay, the loop invariant is not strong enough to say that. <coughs> this one, anyway. So we need to say that, and that's the whole idea of separation logic, how to ex exactly say that situation, explain that situation. <coughs> um, okay. So let's see. The way to do it is to... <coughs> change the definition of the is-list predicates. It's not going to be that anymore, okay? But we'll add a couple of clauses, a couple of conjuncts to the, to, to the definition to make, to make it clear that we don't have sharing, we don't have overlapping like that. And here's the definition. <coughs> In the case uh, when we want to define an empty list, we don't just say that the P pointer is is empty. But we also say that the heap 
that that list occupies is empty itself. And we use a special predicate EMP for that. I'll define its semantics soon, but I just want you to know. The point is to always describe the minimal space that your list occupies. Okay? So here we were just saying P is now, but we didn't say what else holds around it in the old definition. In the new, we want to say there's nothing in this list. Any, it's completely empty. There's no space there. Um, <coughs> Here we are similar, okay? Exists Q, and we say P points to XQ <coughs> and is list Q access. But notice I'm using a different connective here, which is called star, and I'm using a different thing here, which is called points to. I use the different notation over there. So, what is this points to thing? Okay, well, I'll just describe it by picture. It's this picture, okay, we have a P, we have X, and we have Q, and I say that P points to X, Q holds if my heap looks like this. Okay, yes? Yeah, well, separation logic is, is whore logic. It's a variant of whore logic, but it's targeted towards uh, reasoning about programs with pointers. So before separation logic, there were some solutions to how to reason about pointers, but everything was <coughs> pretty bad. <laughs> and the in invention of separation logic was, well, first that you have to say that, that if you adopt the style where you say things about this jointness and you use the connectives such as these, then things become much simpler, or in fact, super simple. Zina, you raise your hand? No, no, I want to. Uh -huh, OK. All right. Um, all right. So let's see. In fact, let me okay. Let me write write ahead. Go uh, go and define. So you see here, I'm saying p points to x semicolon q. This is not actually primitive in separation logic. In separation logic, the primitive is just p points to some v. But for me, p points to x semicolon q would be p points to x, and in the next memory cell, I have q. Does it make sense for, you, for everybody? Yes? Um, did you describe the meaning of uh, star? No I, no, no, I did not. I will right away, but just wanted to introduce, uh, to tell you that this is not. And you can see why this is not the primitive thing, and this is primitive thing. Because sometimes you want to have nodes with three fields, five fields, whatever, right? You don't want to limit yourself to things with two fields. Okay. So here's the formal definition. <coughs> Well, first of all, what is a heap? Okay. Heap will be finite maps from pointers, partial finite maps to V. I will keep V unspecified in, in, in these lectures. I mean, different, if you read any paper on separation logic, different people take different Vs. So sometimes they will just say V will be natural numbers. What does that mean? That means I can store natural numbers into, as contents of my pointers. If you want real memory, you would have to take something like, I don't know, natural numbers modulo the, si the, you know, the size of uh, uh, your, your, your memory word. <coughs> For me, it will be anything. So space of values from high order logic, calculus of constructions, anything that you want. I mean, basically, what that means, as I need to put more things in, I will just be putting them without actually emphasizing that I do. But anyway, now when you have heaps like this, you can give names to specific heaps. So for example, empty would be, can you imagine what it's going to be? Any, any of those people who raised the hand that they know separation logic? Hmm? It would be the nowhere defined finite map, yes. Exactly, everywhere undefined. Okay, here's another one. You can guess what this is going to be. Singleton heap, yes. Pointer x pointing to v, and on everything else it's undefined. And then h1, disjoint union h2, well, you can imagine what, what heap that's going to be, okay? So if you have these three primitives, then you can define 
Separation logic connect is right away. In fact, it's, it's mutatis mutandis. It's almost pointless to do so. But let's do it anyway, just so that you know what it is. So we say that predicate amp holds of the, empty, of the H heap if H is empty. OK? We say that the predicate, this one, P points to V, P maps to V, if H is the singleton. OK? And so now here comes the definition of the star. We say that P star Q holds of H if, anybody can guess? Yeah. If you can find H1 and H2 such that H is a disjoint union of these two things, and P holds of the first and Q holds of the second. OK? But now an interesting thing is, OK, let me erase. I guess I could erase this thing. So those are the new connectives. But now what do we do about the old existing logical connectives? So in particular, what does it mean to say that P and Q hold of H? And how is it different from this one, right? You define this to basically to say that P holds of, that both your pre predicates hold of the same heap. OK, so you don't do any splitting. OK, so with star, you split. With conjunction, you don't. This is, by the way, I did I mention it? It's called separating conjunction. So it is a conjunction, but it's separating one, OK? <coughs> and then you do the same thing for other connectives. So for this junction, it's going to be, again, the same for implication, for quantifiers, equality, whatever. Whatever you need, it's, it just uh, lifts. Uh, it just lifts like that. OK. <coughs> So for an exercise, let's just see a couple of uh, one more thing that I didn't tell you. When I said that heaps is finite map from pointers to values, I omitted to say heaps are not defined on the null pointer. OK, null, null pointer cannot have a content. You never write anything into the null pointer in the heap, yes? What, what are pointers exactly? Natural numbers. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there an identification for a like the null pointer and zero? Like yes. Null is zero, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that um, like each uh, function that we're going to verify, you know, sort of prove correct, uh -huh. um, we sort of logically think about it as having its own heaps um, independent of the outside world. And then whenever we want to use that function, we'll somehow separate that will, that will off from. That will come out to be the case, yes. Okay. That's called uh, small footprint specification. It'll come up in two pages. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but OK, a little bit of exercise first, just to see if people follow. OK, so if I write something like this, or let me write V because I'm using v for values that they put into pointers. What kind of a proposition is this? Yes? You're, you're asking a question, you're... OK. No, I'm just concerned with the things that you have to describe. What are these conditions I'm just trying to reason And how are these four different Which different constraints? The heap ones or the yeah. propositional ones? No, so empty is an always undefined map. So it would be lambda p ptr and, and def. OK, does it make sense? Yes, but I'm what, if, what are they trying to specify in terms of the Oh, empty is the empty heap. You have nothing, nothing allocated, no pointers allocated. OK? And the singleton one says you just have a pointer x allocated, and it stores value v. Somebody was saying something? OK. What kind of a proposition is this? Hmm? False. OK. So from here, this cannot hold. 
what about this thing? Hmm? Is x equal, equal, equal y? Why? It's false, right? Because in both, on both sides we have p. So they are not disjoint, right? If, if we split it, then they should be disjoint. But they are not if they both contain the same pointer. So this is also false. OK. Now, what about this one? What, in, what can we infer out of here? P is equal to Q and X is equal to Y. Right? Is this clear? No? <laughs> okay, well, let's imagine we have a heap which has one pointer called P storing value V. And that same heap has a pointer called Q storing value Y. The heap has one pointer in it, right? This is what it, this predicate says that. <laughs> okay. Are people okay with this? Still puzzled questions? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I would say something even, the only way to grow a heap is to make a disjoint union with something else, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So yeah, remember this is this means only one pointer. Okay. What if I want to say that my heap has one pointer, but maybe something more? How would I say that? Okay. How do I say something that exists? Okay. <laughs> something like this, right? It would be a heap with at least one pointer, right? <coughs> In fact, oftentimes people use abbreviation like that for this. Okay. <coughs> Let's see, what else do we have? Ah, OK. Uh, by now, you, you will be acing this. What kind of predicate is this? A proposition is this? Yeah, that's false too, right? OK. <coughs> OK. So now we have an interesting class of propositions, which is pure ones that don't talk about heaps at all. Okay, so for example, I can combine things like p points to x and x bigger than 3. This guy is pure. Okay, this guy is not pure because it talks about the heap. But that one doesn't talk about the heap at all, so it holds, I mean, independently of what the underlying heap is. Now, <coughs> this. is equivalent to that. Or rather, I'm defining this thing to be equivalent to that. <coughs> oh, what am I talking about? No, they are equivalent. Okay, I'm not defining anything. <laughs> they are equivalent. OK, why are they equivalent? Well, maybe I should have actually given you a set of equations first. Before we come back, push this on the stack. Um, P star amp is if and only if with P, if and only if amp star P. OK? So amp is uni a unit for the, for the star. And star co is commutative and associative.
So a common idiom will be that when in my preconditions and postconditions I have something like this, I replace it with something like that. And these are equivalent because, well, take this guy out, then you have p star x, p points to x star amp. Well, that just p points to x, and then this guy is just you know, something that you add. You can prove that these two are equivalent out of those semantic definitions that I gave you. <coughs> okay, some more exercises. Let's say we have a picture like this. <coughs> what predicate can I use in separation logic to describe this situation? Anybody? Okay, well, x points to 3 and some value, something else beside 3, right? And that value is the same as the, as the address of y. Okay, so that's the left part of the picture. And the right part of the picture is this. Make sense? Okay, can somebody tell me if I wanted to define, um, or rather, let's see, what is the picture for the formula where instead of the star I use ordinary conjunction? x and y and they both point to here and to this. <coughs> okay. So now that you know separation assertion logic, let's see how that proof for this program looks like. <coughs> I have a feeling this whiteboard will be too small for that. Okay, let's do it in stages. <coughs> I'll erase this one too, and I'll, I'll write it in. So. <coughs> okay. We'll start with is list i alpha zero. Then, so I'm writing what's called proof outline, okay? It's supposed to tell you which assertion holds in between the commands of the, of the program. It's not proof, as in, I don't know, type theory, but it's proof outline, because it captures many different proofs can be represented by the same proof outline. So it ignores many, many details. Okay. So what is supposed to hold after the done uh, pointing to nil? I mean, after we write uh, nil into done, well, we will have that and done is equal to nil. Okay. <coughs> I'm sorry, null. Well, that's the same, as I already said over there, as putting star amp around it. Sorry, putting amp here and starring everything. <coughs> but now that is the same as, in fact, I will do it in place, <coughs> and just write is list done nil. OK. So I can see that the loop invariant holds because Ah, and I have erased the loop invariant, or, or it's underneath. Let's just write it right away. 
because I can find alpha and beta for which that thing holds, and those are alpha zero and, and nil. Okay, so I can write exists alpha, and it's the alpha zero, and exists beta, the nil one, such that, well, the, okay, is list i alpha is list done beta and alpha zero is rev alpha plus beta. Did I get it right? Alpha zero is alpha zero, rev of alpha. No, I'm sorry, rev of alpha zero is what we need here. <coughs> so now we do the while. Okay, well, what do we do after we p finish the, the while? We know everything that we knew before, plus if we are now inside the loop, we know that i was not nil. Okay, so we know exists alpha, exists beta. Oops. Is list i alpha, is list done beta, and rev of alpha zero is rev of alpha plus beta, and i is not zero. No, I'm sorry. Okay, but if i is not null, what can we tell about is list? What can we tell about alpha? Alpha cannot be empty, right? Because if, al if, alpha, if alpha was nil, then we knew i must be nil, and the heap, heap occupied by this little predicate is empty as, as well. But now we know that alpha is not nil. So out of here we know, oh, alpha is actually a cons of two things. So there exists x and xs, and then we keep, and exists beta. Let me just write them like this. Such that alpha is equal x cons xs. So let me unfold that right away. Um, and say, okay, i points to x and k for some k, and is list k xs. And I just copy this other stuff. Okay, <coughs> so that was just after the first command, after the second command, okay, one, two. So now we're doing the third command, and the third command was we, re we read from i plus one. Okay, well, what holds now? going to happen now? Can anybody tell? <coughs> um, beta. <coughs> Previously k was a variable which was existentially quantified in this precondition. Okay. Now we are reading from i plus 1, but look, i plus 1 is exactly this position in the heap, right? So I'm just inventing a name for the what used to be existentially quantified alpha varying variable. Now I have a fixed name for it. it just, I just happen to call it the same way. So what's going to happen, I'll just drop the, the existential. Okay. So we have i points to xq star is list qxs star is list done beta and rev of alpha zero is rev of alpha concatenated with beta. <coughs> the next command says I'm writing done into this thing, into i plus one. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. Well, that just means now instead of this k, 
I'll change that into done, but I'm not changing it here. Okay, so now we have exists x, exists xs, exists beta, i points to x done, star is list k xs, star is list done beta, and a pure predicate that just says how the contents of the list combine. <coughs> okay, so what can I do now? Any ideas? I'll take this guy here and I'll combine it with this guy here. I'm describing exactly what the pictures would de describe how the program functions. So because I can commute, stars commute and associate, I can just push these things around any which way I want. And if I take this two things together and star them, what that is giving me is, well, is list i, <coughs> ah, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, hold on. Um, Oh yeah, I could, by the way, yeah, I don't care about done anymore. Okay, is list i x beta star is list k x s and rev alpha zero is rev alpha plus beta and the existential server. Okay, so now you see we, are, we just described that a shuffle happened. We moved the pointer, a node, to, a, to the other list. <coughs> okay. So now we say done. We store i into done. Well, that just means we give a name to a different thing, so now we start calling this thing done. Exist x, exist xs, beta is list done. x colon colon beta is list k x s. And let me not, I'll, I'll stop <laughs> pushing it around, okay. And the next command is i goes to k, which means let me do it in place. <laughs> now we have this. Okay? And we have finished our loop. Okay? And we got, so let me move this thing here. And we have gotten, out of, out of this predicate, we can prove the loop invariant again. Okay? Because we have an alpha, that is xs, and we have a beta, which is x colon old beta. So the proposition was a loop invariant because if we started from it and we ended the loop, we got the same thing. So when we leave the loop, basically we get the loop invariant. Plus, we know <coughs> that the loop condition holds. Or rather, it's, it's, it doesn't hold, it's falsified, because we just exited the loop. So we know that i is equal to null. OK. Well, we take that i is equal to null and we plug it into this thing. What does it tell us? What does it tell us? It tells us that, OK, I'll scratch this, and we learn that alpha 0 must be uh, nil, and we have an empty, an empty heap underneath. Well, empty and starring with something, well, we can just erase empty, and we are left with this. Okay, and this is a pure predicate, so we can just 
drop it because it doesn't talk about, uh, I mean, it's, un it's under underlying heap is empty, right? So we can just drop that as well. Or rather, I'm sorry, we have to put it here. Okay, right. So, uh, what are we getting? We're getting is, last, is list done nil and rev of alpha zero is rev of nil. Well, that's nil. Concatenate that with beta, you get beta. Um, no, I did something wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, we had a beta here. Right, okay. Easily is done beta and rev alpha zero is beta. Okay, so that tells us what we got in the done in, in the ending list is exactly the reversal of the initial list. So we got a proof. Everybody fine with this? Okay. Well, let me not erase it. We won't actually go be going back to it, but <coughs> All right. So now it just turns out that if you go through this proof outline, and you know it has this form, you write something, then the command, then you write something, then a command, and so on. You can take an arbitrary predicate, let's call it R, and you can just keep adding it here to all your assertions. Okay, you can see from how I derived the, the thing, from the fact that star commutes and associates, that I will never actually ever, ever look at this R, right? I will be just messing in directly in place, so to speak, changing uh, the descriptions of the heaps that I manipulate, and this R is just sits around, okay? <coughs> in fact, that's a general property. It's not just true of this particular proof outline, but in fact, you have this particular rule which says, if I manage to prove something, some P and Q for some program C, then I can add R to it. Okay? This is called a celebrated frame rule, okay? And this R is called the frame. So you're framing because you're adding stuff, which doesn't matter, okay? <coughs> um, there's a bunch of side conditions to this inference rule in the classical design, but I won't mention them here because we'll, in the design I'll show you eventually, I mean, they will be omitted. <coughs> okay. Now, it turns out that this rule holds, this rule is sound, because whichever heap manipulating command we wanted to use, okay, there was always something in the assertion prior to that command which described that that pointer that I want to manipulate is there, exists, and it has some value, okay? Um, <coughs> for example, um, yeah, I mean, if I wanted to manipulate, to read from i plus one here, you see I, need, I had a pre predicate over there which says, well, i plus one stores k, okay? <coughs> In general, this is the property of separation logic. Um, every command and every program, okay, which wants to manipulate a certain, um, certain set of pointers, that set of pointers will have to be described as existing and having certain values in the precondition of that program. Okay. And oftentimes, that set is called the footprint of the program. Okay. And oftentimes, we specify only the footprint of the program and nothing else, which was your question before, right? Because if we want that something else, we can just add whatever we want. Okay. So you can imagine that things would go bad, for example, if I try to add something which, which, if I try to add a command to the reverse program which is not in the footprint. Let's say I decide here to add y colon equals two. Or not y, let's say some, some completely something unrelated, some pointer, I don't know, <laughs> t. Okay. Well, if I just add t, as, as a command, intuitively you can see why the frame rule would stop, stop holding. Let's imagine that I choose as a frame something which says t points to three. Well, if t points to three and I write to t 
2 into t, then at the end, certainly t is not going to be 3. So I cannot just propagate the frame. But in separation logic, we wouldn't be able to use, to write such a, pro or rather to verify such a program, because, well, if you want to manipulate t, you better have t somewhere in the precondition to it, and we don't have it. Okay? So this would not be a well-proved program, so to speak, in separation logic. <coughs> so the fact that the frame rule holds, or the reason why it, why, it's hold, why it holds, is the semantic definition of the notion of Hor triple. Okay, it's a little bit special. It's a little bit different from ordinary Hor logic in that it says the following. And if you read carefully, you know, the papers on separation logic, it, it's there. The definition is there. It says um, PCQ holds not only if whenever P holds, I run C, I get Q. But in fact, in addition to that, if P holds, then C will not crash. C is safe to run. Okay? So that's, that's called fault avoidance. That's how they called it in separation logic. I think it was called like that before in, in Hoare logic too. In fact, I think the concept is attributed to, to Tony Hoare and Nick Worth. But you see what it says. Programs that are proved in separation logic are safe for the, for the predicate, are sa safe for every heap describing the predicate. In other words, well-proved programs don't go wrong in this, in this system, right? No, seriously, this is, this is an important, I see you're laughing. You're recognizing where I'm going with this, right? This is one connection that separation, very important connection that separation logic has with type theory, okay? Because, well, if well-proved programs don't go wrong, why not make types out of these things and then just reduce everything to the famous Milner motto of, well, type programs don't go wrong, okay? Which is precisely what we'll do next. <laughs> 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 How did that happen? Yes. <laughs> The thing, okay, so instead of doing this, instead of writing things like, like the whole triple, I'll write them like this. Okay. And I'll start making everything look very like functional programming. In particular, I will remove variables like this k, which are mutable. Okay, yes, question? Okay, question to the left. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, which, can you point out what, what confuses you? You know what, Let, let's not do that because, I mean, it will take us a lot of time, but I will give you lecture notes and there it's all done in detail. So is that, is that okay? All right. <coughs> Where were we? Oh, types, okay. So, Things will start looking like lambda calculus or Haskell instead of, instead of mutable variables, okay? And I mean, maybe you cannot appreciate the point now, but I mean, let me just tell you, it, it will simplify a lot of things. And in particular, the standard definitions of separation logic come with side conditions which are annoying, and they just disappear if you switch to the functional setting, and that will get some mileage out of that in the concurrent case, okay? <coughs> So let me start writing types, okay? So now this is to give you the inference rules for the typing rules, so to speak, for every command. <coughs> yes? Yes. No, it can terminate, uh, but it doesn't have to. Going wrong is orthogonal to termination. No, no, no. If P holds, then the program doesn't crash. And if it terminates, then Q. Can you write that out as logically? Uh, what, the soundness? The definition of the, the... Yeah, sure. I mean, people have done it in, in right, Isabel. The, the Wynn Schoolbook has one uh, okay. definition for regular Hoare logic. Mm -hmm. I think it might take a lot of people to figure it out. Okay. Um, okay. We say that P, C, Q. Um, okay. For every heap H, if H satisfies P, then um, C doesn't crash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, 
for every other m such that if I run in H, I run C and I get M, then Q of M. Oh. Yes? Yes. Oh, that, that's definitely true, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. So this is all partial correctness semantics. So it means going wrong, I mean, I'm sorry, looping is not actually considered going wrong. Yeah. It just, if I end up looping forever, this triple doesn't say anything about my end result because there's no end result. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So I'll start writing things as types, as I said. And this is based on a paper that I published before, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and avoid certain things, and I'm going to give you inference rules, which are not exactly what's in the paper. but So they're lying a little bit, but not too much. So anyway, I will tell you where the lie is anyway. So. <coughs> Ah, I'm sorry, <laughs> before we get there. <coughs> so, these types, it turns out they will be, have you heard of monads? Do people know what monads are? Okay. Sorry, I have to check. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't be asking that in this summer school, but. <laughs> so I didn't tell you this thing, but in core logic, there is usually this distinction between commands, which is what you've seen so far, this I colon equals something, and then pure expressions, which are just expressions, you know, natural numbers, boolean, stuff like that. So in core logic, there is always the distinction between pure and impure. And, yeah, well, guess what? There is another formal system which, does, which makes the same distinction, which is monads, okay? So we will just make um, this type be a monadic type with some more information on it, okay? So it's a monad, but with P and Q as indices, so to speak. Um, Ah, uh, yeah, so now the monadic computation also returns values. So instead of just writing this, CPQ, it will turn out that I will have to say something like this, CPAQ, for a computation which does not crash if P holds, and if it terminates, it gives me a value of type A, and a post-condition Q, okay? <coughs> so we will have, okay, first monadic unit. People know what that is, right? Can somebody guess what its type is going to be? Hmm? We'll start with amp, and what do we get in the end? Aha! So Q has to change. So Q now is not just a predicate over heaps, but has to be predicate over a return value and a heap. So basically I have to say something like this, lambda r, r is equal x and amp. Is it readable behind? Okay. Does it make sense? In fact, I'll just be dropping this lambda r constantly and by notation agreement, I will, I will use the letter r for, for the return value of a, of a program, okay? <coughs> x, the argument here, okay? <coughs> um, what should we have as the type for mutation? <coughs> Anybody? Let's say forward. <laughs> if it makes a difference. You don't have to remember. The point is, okay, we need to know that X exists. We don't care what's in it, which we will write like this. That's exist V such that X points to V. It's just an abbreviation. And in the end, we know what? Well, we know that we have written into X, so now X points to V. The return value is of type unit. So if it's of type unit, I don't bother saying that what its value is, right? 
So I'll just keep it like this. Okay, make sense? Allocation. We start with empty heap. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to pass some value. And we get as an output some pointer storing our value. Okay. The allocation. Oh, actually, ah, I will actually need a different allocation command with more than one argument. Okay, I'll overload and call it also alloc, but I'll pass it a list. And then I will have r points to v1, and then r plus 1 points to v2, and so on. r plus n minus 1 points to vn. So I want an allocation command which gives me n consecutive locations. Okay. Will just be useful. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Can you have pointers to pointers? Yeah, sure. It's just pointers are natural numbers. So if you just store a natural number into your pointer, it's we've seen examples, right? Um, yeah, those graphs they draw with. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so now the look, the the inference rule for a lookup. That might be a little bit tricky. OK. So we want to say something like, if we start from x being equal to v, uh, then my r is going to be v, and I didn't change the heap. But now what is this v? OK. So in, so in core logic in general, this kind of, this is a free variable right now, right? <laughs> the v. So that's not good. So what we'll do here is we will introduce another context in front of our types. This is like a universal quantification, which says, oh, for any v, you know, whatever is in your heap, that's what you return, and you didn't change the heap. So you want to say, it's, this is like for all, OK? <coughs> but it's a for all that scopes only over the type. I don't want to put it in the program. Everybody fine with this? That means I have to go back and put gammas everywhere, but here I don't uh, put contexts in brackets here, but you know, everywhere it's empty, so I don't bother. <coughs> so now we have the next thing is monadic. So we had monadic unit, we had a bunch of primitives, and now we need monadic bind or sequential composition. Okay, so here's one rule. If I have a context of this, these are called logical variables. I don't know if I mentioned it. Logical variables, OK? The other ones are program variables. Okay. If I have P, A, Q, OK? And so now, if X, A, T2, X, R, Q, B, R, then I will write things like this. Oh, I forgot to put the gamma. Oops. And you need the text is fresh and that it doesn't appear in free variables of B and R. Does it make sense? Can anybody explain why, why am I renaming r by x here? Yes, go ahead. You have a question or you have an explanation? No, 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 I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Um, hmm. <laughs> okay. So, right, so let's see if I can quickly explain monads. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, make a distinction between purely functional computation, purely functional things, those are called expressions, and imperative things, mut mut things that mutate state, which we will call commands. So what monads do is they let you mix those two together. In particular, you can write a command, which is something imperative, but you slap it with a type, then you make an expression out of it. You slap it with a type which says this guy is effectful. Right? So if you have a if you have a, some computation, some program, let's say, you know, 3 plus 2 that has a type nat, okay? If I do something, so that's one thing, but if I do something effectful in order to compute and return a natural number, I will say monad nat, okay? And this thing here will be something that mutates states and then returns a natural number. But because I put, I don't want to put nat on it because then it means it's purely functional. But if I put m nat of it, then... It means what's inside is effectful, but from the outside, I actually don't care. I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's not. It looks like it's purely functional, so I can pass it to other functions as arguments and so on. Right? The same thing here. Instead of, just instead of M, I use PQ. Okay? So a distinction between a type which says some precondition A postcondition is that the program of this type is something that can manipulate state. If I just said something of type A, well, then that's something purely functional. Unless this A itself is a, a triple, but you can combine these things and nest them and so on. Well, Does it make sense? Yeah. I run a paper called for type theory. Okay. And I can explain the fact that the for type is a special kind of monad. Yeah. So it yeah, that's it. Yeah, this is it, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the context? Here, gamma. Whatever, it's the same thing as here. It's gamma all over. OK. By the way, you can see that this rule for sequential composition or monadic bind is what we use to justify these proof outlines, right? Because I can write this vertically as P, um, and then, I don't know, x points to C, x gets C1, and then I get Q of. It should be R, I apologize. Yeah. And then we have C2 and then Q. But we have to check here. We have R, I'm sorry. We have to check here that X is not used in R. So when I start writing proof outlines in this style, there will be side conditions to check at the very end. Oh, did I actually remove my bound variable from, from the, from the post-condition that survives? Okay. A couple of more things. <coughs> Conditionals. If you have a Boolean, I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, P and B, A, Q, and C2, P and not B. A Q, then if B, then C1, else C2, B, A, Q. X is replacing R. Okay, little, little R. Yeah, but below that, you would say R looks like R. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, okay. I'm <laughs> you caught me. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> No, you're right. Okay. <coughs> and then we have a fixed point combinator, which says, have you heard of dependent pi types? That must have been mentioned in the rest of the school, right? OK. Um, You know what? Let me just write it a little bit differently. Just to save some. Do 
people recognize this as a fixed point type, a type of fixed point combinator. So here we just take T to be, um, oh, let me just write it like this. <laughs> P is X A gamma, some P, some B, some Q, where X can scope over all these things. What does this mean? This means that I can do, that I can write fixed point computations, but I will consider them impure. So I will slap them in the, with a monad. Okay, whenever I'm, I'm using a fixed point, that means there's a monad around. Okay, then we have a couple of structural rules. I can erase this? Uh, Here? Right. So uh huh. Which assignment rule? Uh, we did the original if the if x points to if we assign x to some to b. Yeah. Then if x points to something, then x will point to b. We did what we before. That is, yeah. I guess I erased I it. it yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so traditional for semantics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're not using an existential here, right? No. And so is the reason we don't have to use existential because we don't have anything like pointer arithmetic? No, we do have pointer arithmetic. I think what we don't have here is yeah. the stack variables, mutable okay. variables. Yes. Okay. These are purely functional variables, so things become much, much simpler. There is an existential here. I'm just going to hide the Oh, okay. Oh, wait. You were t okay, fine. No, it's not primitive. No, when I oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you then. Yeah. Uh, you're referring to this thing? Yes. No, that's just exists V of some type. We can even quantify over the type, okay. such that X points to V. Oh. It, it's a usual thing in separation logic. Whenever I don't want to slap more existentials, okay. I just use underscores when, when these things don't matter. Okay. <coughs> Where was I? Um, structural rules, OK. How are we doing with time? 15 more minutes? <coughs> OK, we have a rule for logical variable elimination. So if I have something which says gamma x colon a, px, a, qx, and I have gamma e of type a, then I can substitute. So that tells you that this thing is like a universal quantification. So I will get gamma p of e, a, q of e. OK, makes sense? Context weakening, let me not write the rule, but whenever I have something saying gamma here, I can put more stuff. Okay? And the rule, this is an important one, existential rule. Okay, let me write it top, top down. Or, I'm sorry, bottom up. If I have gamma, and in the precondition I have exists A colon A such that P of X and B and Q, then I can take this guy X and put it in gamma. And you'll see this over and over again in the proof outlines that we'll write. And then I forgot the rule of consequence. That's an important rule. If I have managed to prove some P1 and Q1, then under which condition can I change those into P2 and Q2? And I'm omitting the type A here because it's doesn't matter too much for this rule. Well, if I can prove that P2 implies P1 and Q1 implies P Q2. Does this make sense? Um, so what's the definition of implication for this? Um, we, thing? It's the same as conjunction. Oh. The same heaps, heap holds for both. Yeah. Okay. And then the rule of frame, but we've seen that, so let, not, let, let me not write that. So, okay. Those are the rules. I 
I did say that I'm cheating a little bit, but it's, it's going to be in the lecture notes. So let's, let me not go away where I'm right now where I'm cheating. So, okay. <coughs> let's go ahead, practice on, so on a few examples because that's more important right now. <coughs> okay. We want to show this. If I do, if I read from X and then return that thing, I want to say that it has this type. Is this, is this legible? I'm sorry. Guys in the back? Okay. Hmm? Yeah, I'm just trying to say, if I start with something that was bigger than three, I'm gonna get something that's bigger than three in the end. Okay, why is this, why am I actually mentioning this, this why am I bringing up this particular example? Because, okay, if you actually try to do the proof outline, you will notice, okay, we want, we have a context gamma, so I'm writing it now vertically, okay? Let me keep this up and let me work on this side because we will be. <coughs> okay. And leave some space and we have return t here. Well, we are trying, we, we, we want to prove something for a context where we have logical variable v and we have x points to v and v bigger than 3. The what, I'm sorry, oh, the bang, yes. But, and I have just erased it, didn't I? The type for bang is completely different, right? Because it says x points to v, then I'm gonna get you x points to v. What do we do about this v bigger than three? Okay, can somebody guess? I'm sorry? Exactly, yes, so frame rule. So for x, so for bang x, we had m, I'm sorry, <coughs> we had v, x points to v, and then x points to v, and r is 3, uh, r is v. What do we frame it with? Here's that exercise that I told you. I'm sorry? Yeah. So, or if you want to be really explicit, amp and v points bigger than three. And then amp just disappears because you mesh it with the rest. So yeah, so this is how the proofs are going to look like. I'll let me leave it here. Um, we start with something, we look at the first command, it doesn't match the proof, it doesn't match what we have up above in two different ways, either because the context is not right or the precondition is not right. For the context, when that's not right, we use the rules for, we substitute, we weaken, we do whatever we can to get the context to match. And after we do that, then by framing, we get the preconditions to match, and then we proceed. So here, what we're, what we're going to get is V, by framing, x, x points to V, and V bigger than three, and T equal V. Right? Notice here we have R equal V, but here we substitute t for r, so because we want to have t equals v, right? Not r equals v, because r doesn't exist here. <coughs> and now for return, well, that just had a precondition m, postcondition m. So again, we need to frame by this whole thing, right? And then we get v, x points to v. We just pr propagate everything, right? v bigger than 3. And r is equal v. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, t is equal v and r is equal t because r is what we're returning. But now we have a side condition because by the time we exit this program t is a bound variable, its scope is up to here. It shouldn't exist in the post condition. So now by the rule of consequence, we change this guy, we weaken it into, well you can see what I'm doing. 
and um, well, r is equal v and t doesn't factor in the proof anymore in the proposed condition. And that's how we get that. Yes? Yes, I could have probably put the context, I could have tracked T around and then here I have to make sure it's not there. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm giving you a few exercises and eventually I'll stop writing this context. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, yeah, it becomes tedious, okay. <coughs> One more exercise, and then just quickly through more interesting. Okay, let's say we want to implement a stack, okay, as a single link list with a sentinel pointer. Let's call it pointer S and T, and we want to have two methods that manipulate that stack, push and pop. Can somebody tell me how we, what specs do we want to give to such program to push and pop? First of all, how do we describe the state of the stack? Stack is a single linked list and we want a sentinel pointer. Any ideas? Yeah. So I will write this predicate, stack, and I'll pass it a purely functional list alpha, and I'll define it to say S and T points to, um, well, exists Q and is list Q alpha. Okay? What would be a spec for a push method? Let's say the stack stores <laughs> values of type alpha. Exactly, yes. It's pretty simple, right? But this alpha has to be bound here. Okay. So one of your homeworks would be to implement push and prove it. Let me now give you a purely functional version of uh, what we started with, with, with the reverse. Okay. Let me erase this. Now in this purely functional setting, reverse can be implemented completely differently. And I think it's very nice. So now we don't have two variables, done and I. We just pass I. Okay, this is just functional programming, so it shouldn't be too surprising. Um, let me write it like this. I will leave space for the type here. <coughs> and here we'll have something like, okay, uh, recursive function. Let rec fun <coughs> f i done ptr if i is null then return done um, else okay k is bang i plus one i plus one is done f of ki, and I call all of that in fi null. You agree that this is the same program, just done in the functional setting. But now I want to tell you um, what types you can give it, because it's kind of interesting. So this just becomes the specification that we had before. Is list i alpha zero, and when I don't want to call the return result done, uh, R, I will actually put a lambda. So I'll say lambda done here is list done rev alpha zero. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. This was supposed to be a type here. So that's for the whole problem. But now for the loop, we're not doing a while, we are doing a recursive function, it's a little bit more interesting. <coughs> Notice alpha zero used to be, for us in the old setting, a global variable which says what the, our initial list. Now that just scopes over this type. 
it's not in the program. So we cannot use alpha zero for the loop invariant. It just doesn't exist. It's not there. It's not in scope. The type of this recursive function will actually serve as the loop invariant. So the type that we will give to f will be dependent on i and done. <coughs> Look like this. It will say alpha beta. Um, OK. Is list alpha star is list i alpha and is list done beta. Then in the end, we have is list r reverse of alpha and beta. Is it clear what this is saying? It says, pick out alpha and beta, which stand for the list that we have. OK? And then what we are going to get in the end is a pointer, OK, which points to the reverse list. I mean, the reverse first list attached to the, to the second. OK, but then the trick is, you can imagine this is also going to be a homework for you, to take this program and annotate it with, with what holds where with the assertions, write a proof outline for it. And then the trick would be to connect this alpha zero with this alpha and beta. And that will happen here. Okay? <coughs> okay, we can stop, I guess. Yeah, all right. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Everything clear. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs>